Progressive Stages of Meditation on Emptiness, by Venkenpo Tsultram Jiamso Rinpoche, translated and arranged by Shenpen Hook M. Stage 4, Prasangika Approach The Svatantrika system is very effective for a first understanding of emptiness because it cuts through one's attachment to things as real. However, even though the Svatantrikas themselves think they teach an understanding that goes beyond concepts, from the Prasangika point of view their understanding is still subtly conceptual. The Prasangikas argue that to establish emptiness through reasoning is a subtle attempt to grasp the ultimate nature with the conceptual mind. Reason shows the conceptual mind is always in error, it can only ever give a distorted and ultimately self-contradictory version of experience, never the nature of reality itself. Therefore they refuse to use any reasoning to establish the true nature of phenomena. They say that since the ultimate nature is beyond even the most subtle concepts, nisprapanka, it is misleading to try to establish or prove nisprapanka as a description or a concept that expresses the ultimate nature of reality. They are adamant in not positing anything either positive or negative. Some argue that this a dishonest view in the sense that one is simply sidestepping issues and refusing to allow opponents to refute one's views. However, there is something very profound in this method. It is quite uncompromising in its systematic refutation of all conceptual attempts to grasp the nature of the Absolute. The original Prasangikas in India and Tibet did not assert anything about the relative appearance of phenomena either. They considered the nature of this also to be beyond even the most subtle concepts of existence, non-existence etc. Some later Prasangikas, namely the Gelugpa school of Tibet, do hold views concerning the nature of relative phenomena. They establish through reasoning that relative phenomena exist conventionally, via Vahara, Thas Niaddu. Other Prasangikas are very doubtful that such a system can be considered Prasangika at all. A number of very powerful refutations of the Gelugpa view have been made by both Gelugpa and other scholars and debate still continues to this day, even now as the Dharma spreads to the West. The debate will certainly continue here. Maybe Western scholars will resolve it, where Tibetans have failed to do so. We will only be considering the original Prasangika view in this meditation progression on emptiness. That is, we will confine ourselves to refuting all views, but not asserting any counter-argument establishing any view of our own. This amounts to a complete destruction of all conceptual views, leaving one with no alternative than a non-conceptual view of the nature of reality. The aim of the Prasangika is to silence completely the conceptual mind, allowing the mind to rest in absolute freedom from concepts. Absolute freedom from concepts is what Prasangikas call emptiness. The absolute nature of reality is emptiness in that sense only. It cannot be established as empty nor even as freedom from concepts, nisprapanksa, by the conceptual mind because that is not true emptiness or true freedom from concepts, these are just concepts too. Finally therefore, the Prasangikas are not saying anything about the ultimate nature of reality or of emptiness. That is not the aim of their system. Their aim is to free the awareness of its conceptualizing habit and to let the ultimate nature of reality reveal itself in a totally non-conceptual way. It is a very powerful system in that it gives the conceptual mind nothing to grasp onto at all. In contrast to the Svatantrika which is good for refuting non-Buddhist systems, the Prasangika is very good for refuting subtle views held in other Buddhist systems. It shows how, although they all claim to go beyond concepts, they still have subtle concepts as long as they try to establish the nature of reality through reason and the use of concepts. The Dream Example The Svatantrika view is like realizing that the dream fire or dream tiger are not real. In this way there is the subtle concept of a real emptiness and an unreal fire or tiger. In other words there is a subtle conceptual division between the absolute and the relative truths. The Prasangika view is like realizing the true nature of the dream fire or dream tiger directly without first negating the dream and establishing emptiness. If there is no concept of real, there is no concept, unreal. If there is no concept, self-nature, there is no concept, absence of self-nature. Thus the mind rests in total peace without any conceptual contrivance whatever. 
The dream tiger does not need the concept of emptiness to negate a reality it never had. This is obviously a much more advanced way of practicing than that of the Svetantrika. For an ordinary person it is not possible to gain a non-conceptual understanding of emptiness immediately. It is very good to use the Svetantrika approach to establish emptiness at first. This cuts through one's ordinary conceptual way of thinking which takes existence and non-existence for granted. Then one has to use the Prasangika to cut through the conceptual mind completely. It enables one to cut through the tendency to separate the relative truth of how things appear from the absolute truth of how they actually are. As long as one separates the two truths, one's understanding of emptiness is subtly conceptual. Once one lets go of the tendency to subtly divide the two truths, one sees the relative as naturally empty. It is like seeing dreams naturally as they are without contrivance or confusion. Then one sees that relative and absolute truth are just names for two aspects of one reality. Even the terms relative and absolute are conceptual creations. Ultimately there is no such distinction. In a dream many things appear that are empty. If they are empty and not real, how can their empty essence be real? To hold a concept that the ultimate nature of the dream appearances is emptiness is not to see their nature properly. The awareness must rest meditatively without creating any concepts of real or unreal, empty or not empty, existent or not existent etc. Until that non-conceptual nature has been discovered, however, it is not possible to avoid subtle positive and negative concepts. That is why it is useful to go through all the stages of this meditation progression on emptiness. At each stage you will learn to recognize and familiarize yourself with all the subtle concepts that are going to creep into your meditation again and again. Recognizing them, you will see their nature more and more clearly and eventually the mind will tire of them. Just as darkness cannot exist in the presence of light, ignorance cannot exist in the presence of awareness that rests without concepts. At first the mind rests like that for just brief moments at a time, but gradually, by recognizing the significance and importance of these moments, they are fostered and as the conceptual tendencies grow weaker, the non-conceptual awareness grows stronger and stronger, like the sun emerging from behind clouds. Method of Investigation Khandrakirti was the great proponent of the Prasangika system, and he relied a lot on arguments that showed that dharmas did not arise. If dharmas can be shown never to arise it goes without saying that they do not abide or perish and that they have no self-nature. Santoraksita, a Svetantrika on the other hand, argued in his Matyamakalamkara that if you can show that things have no self-nature, it is easy to show they do not arise stay or perish. Khandrakirti used the argument that inner and outer things do not arise from themselves, from something other than themselves, from both or from neither i.e. causelessly. Since that covers all four possibilities, this argument shows that nothing truly arises. For something to arise it first has to be absent. The Samkhyas believed that things arose from themselves. Khandrakirti refuted the saying that if something already existed it would not need to arise. Arising has no meaning for something which already exists. The Hinayana Buddhist schools, the Vaibhasikas and Sotrantikas, believed that things arose from what was other than themselves. In other words one moment gave rise to the next. Khandrakirti argued that no connection exists between one moment and the next. A moment arises at the very instant that the moment before disappears. Something that has no connection with another thing can hardly be called its cause otherwise one could say darkness was the cause of light or light the cause of darkness, just because the one followed on from the other. Since, in this way things arising from themselves and things arising from something else are refuted, one might try to argue that things arise from both. The Jains thought this. Khandrakirti argued that such a position has the faults of both the previous positions. Maybe one would like to argue that things arise from nothing? This would be like the belief of those who deny all cause and effect, including karma cause and effect. Such a school existed in India. They were called the Ajivakas and Khandrakirti refuted their view by saying that if things arose without cause what would be the point of doing anything? For example, why should a farmer bother to plant his crops, 
if causes do not bring about effects. Such a belief, which suggests that everything is haphazard and chaotic, is totally non-scientific. Maybe a film is a good example of how things are non-arising. We all know that when we see a moving film it is really a series of still frames being projected onto the screen in very quick succession. It may look as if one thing is affecting another thing on the screen, but, in fact, except for the sequential arrangement, there is no connection between them. There are even gaps between the pictures. For something to cause something else there has to be a point where they meet, otherwise how could the one affect the other? But a cause never exists at the same time as its effect. Once the effect has arisen the cause is past. The cause has to precede its effect, otherwise cause has no meaning. If they arise together at the same moment they cannot be cause and effect. In the Prasangika system this argument is developed in detail and at great length. Although we have not looked at it in detail here, we have seen, at least, the kind of reasoning used. It is important to understand that what is being argued about here is the ultimate nature of things. Of course on a gross level, everyone has to agree that, for example a candle flame arises from the wick and wax of the candle and from the wood and flame of a match and so on. It is when one examines the concept of causality very minutely that it begins to fall apart, and this is what the Prasangikas are interested in. As to the way apparent causality works in the world, the Prasangika does not claim to have anything to add to what the world says about it. However, for the Prasangika the arising of things is mere relative appearance. There is no arising in the absolute. As in dreams, relatively things appear to arise but they do not arise in the ultimate analysis. There is arising in the conceptual essence, of phenomena, the absolute essence of phenomena is without arising, Ranamrito Gingo Boskai Ba Red Don Dam Pa Ingo Boskai Ba Med Pared. The Prasangika does not hold the position that either the absolute or the relative arise or do not arise exist or do not exist etc. The Prasangikas are very careful to emphasize that as well as things not being truly existent, Dan Pa are grub, and not arising, Sky Ba, they are also not not truly existing, Dan Pa are RNA grub and not non-arising, sky be med pot. Such positions are equally unsatisfactory, because if true existence does not exist, then neither can its opposite not true existence, since that only has meaning in relation to existence. If similarly there is no arising, there is no non-arising. In this way they make sure that all concepts, positive and negative, are negated and that nothing is asserted in their place. In other words the Prasangika system is beyond any mental grasping whatsoever, BLOI Jink Dang Tom's Cad Lost Das Pa. Incidentally when it is said that the Prasangika holds no position or view it means he does not truly believe any view or position or hold anything as his absolute and final opinion. It does not mean that Kondrakirti, for example could not say I'm Kondrakirti and I live in Nalanda. Just saying something does not mean that one holds it as ultimately true. The reason we have not dwelt at length here on all the detailed arguments used by Kondrakirti and other commentators is that we are talking about the meditator's approach. Jamgon Kontrol Rinpoche, in his Encyclopedia of Knowledge, in the chapter on Samatha and Vipassana explains that the meditator only needs to analyze intellectually very briefly, just enough to convince himself of the way to meditate. Then he should drop all doubt and intellectual inquiry and rest his mind naturally without any conceptual contrivance. Of course if one still has doubts one will have to return again and again to the study and reflective stages of the practice. When actually meditating, however, one must let all doubts subside and rest the mind without artifice. Base Path and Fruit The base for both Svatantrika and Prasangika Madhyamakas is the two truths, the path is the two accumulations, Samhara, and the fruit is the two Kayas, Buddha bodies. For the Prasangika, during the meditation session one rests one's mind without conceptual effort on the inseparable two truths. One clings to no concept of good, bad, happy sad etc. Even time has no meaning. Some people get very attached to time and think it is very important how long they meditate and so on. 
this can become a great obstacle to realizing the non-contrived state. Time itself never arises. To meditate like this is to accumulate wisdom, Jnana Samhara. Between sessions, however, one has to deal with one's everyday life. Here we see cause and effect working all the time. They may not ultimately arise but they appear to do so to the conceptual mind, so it is important to respect that and not to confuse the levels of the teaching. Between sessions there is good and bad, skillful and unskillful actions that lead to happiness and suffering respectively. So it is very important to use this time for performing good actions like serving the triple gem, giving help where needed and so on. This is called the accumulation of good, punyasamhara, for the benefit of all beings. Although this path is called the path of the two accumulations, in the last analysis there is no accumulation, no path, and no fruit. The mind is naturally free from mental constructions. There is nothing to add or remove. This is emptiness without any sense of negating anything and without any concept of emptiness. The mind just rests naturally in its natural state without contrivance. The fruit is the two bodies of Buddha. Samsara is conceptual elaboration, Nirvana is absence of conceptual elaboration, Nisprapanksa. Although the Dharmakaya is the cessation of all conceptual elaboration, on the path to Buddhahood, the Bodhisattvas make vows and wishes out of compassion for beings, and through the power of their compassion, the results of their past vows and the pure karma of beings they are able to manifest form bodies when they reach Buddhahood. These form bodies are in essence free from conceptual elaboration, but because of the concepts of beings they are able to appear to them. They appear to their pure vision, but they are not the Absolute Buddha. Method of Meditation For this meditation the mind should be very relaxed. Having taken refuge and aroused Bodhisattva, let the mind rest, vast and spacious, like clear and empty space. Whenever the mind gets tense from too much studying and so on, one should let the mind rest naturally without contrivance in the natural non-contrived emptiness of mind. This is the way to relax the mind. If you have understood correctly the non-contrived state, you will find all tension and emotional disturbance subsides, like ocean waves becoming still by themselves. Whenever strong passions like anger, desire, or jealousy arise letting the mind rest without contrivance is sufficient remedy, without doing anything at all. They simply subside and come to rest by themselves. Similarly with suffering, if one rests in its essence without contrivance, that sensation of suffering becomes spaciousness and peace. It is important also to rest the mind like this when the mind is happy. Otherwise one will lose one's equanimity at the point of change when the happiness comes to an end.